Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay, so I get the sense just from sitting in the audience that a lot of people here are, are developers and in the development community. And how many are working, just if you don't mind sharing, are working on blockchain solutions right now or integrating it? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna try not to be super repetitive because I know we, we covered a lot of the same ground earlier today. Uh, so my name is Margaret Wallace and I do work with uh, M2 Insights. And M2 Insights, in case you're not uh, familiar with them, they're one of the one of the few analysts who work in the game space, but M2 Insights also works in um, just in general technology, graphics, hardware technology, and I'm a senior analyst there, and this is sort of their, their whole infrastructure. And uh, in case you don't know me, I've been in the game industry for quite a while. I'm an entrepreneur and founder. I, I actually still own a company in New York called Playmatics, and I've been really intrigued by the power and potential of, of blockchain and um, this isn't really an I'm not this isn't really an advertisement for M2 Insights, but I would, you know, encourage you if you haven't been to the site. One thing I've discovered, uh, being a founder and an entrepreneur, is sometimes it costs money to have access to data, right? And and while although M2 does make money selling bespoke reports, there is a lot of information and resources up there if, that are available to anyone. And and we all know information is power. And then a little bit later on at the end of this talk, I'll be making a sort of a special announcement that is hopefully relevant um, to everyone here. And so uh, we, we covered a lot of the ground about the opportunity. I mean, we all know, if, if for those of us who come from the uh, free-to-play game sector, how little uh, virtual goods really monetize. You know, we talk about the whales. Um, so much of our creative endeavors have focused on catering to the whales, right? You know, keeping the 95% the of the audience happy and keeping that community going, but really trying to monetize, if you're lucky, the 5% who actually do purchase free-to-play items. And I've experienced that myself on a number of levels. And so I think that's what's driven, that's really drawn a lot of us in games to use, looking at blockchain as a, as a potentially viable technology for the games we make, but also looking at cryptocurrency. And I think all of us in this room who have been in the game industry know um, games, you know, from the beginning of my career, um, games were always on the cutting edge. We always uh, amassed the largest audiences, and, and it's, you know, amazing to me how much we as an industry drive all sorts of innovation within technology in general, but also in, inside other sectors. And so, um, and so while games are a natural fit in a lot of ways for what a lot of the things blockchain and cryptocurrency tries to solve, we also provide essentially a sandbox for multiple other sectors and industries. And I, I think that's what's really amazing, especially in light of when you're talking about blockchain. And so, and then any of us who have run um, free-to-play games before, um, we know that fraud is rampant, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what size your game is, if you are accepting e-commerce transactions, a sign of your success is that somebody will try to game your system, right? And so that's another reason why a lot of folks are drawn to, the, to blockchain. And then here's another area that I think is really um, a, a fun way that blockchain is being used, and that's but has a lot of potential creative opportunity and well, as well, and that's around community management. Now, I grabbed that photo from, from an old South Park episode as a joke um, to talk about like, trolls and trolling and all that. But if you think about um, how we could potentially leverage, and, and by the way, a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about right now, I've spent the past few months just talking to everyone I possibly can who's working in this in this arena, not only within games, but within other sectors such as smart energy or um, community, community management, you know, real world community management. And 
I definitely believe a lot of the things that we're going to be, as I said, developing within the game industry will have larger implications. And one of them is uh, the idea of using um, smart contracts and, and distributed ledgers to track and manage players across games and potentially across life, right? I mean, it, it really spills out into, um, you know, the, lar the world, in the real world at large, where you hear of governments and companies experimenting with social reputation systems. Well, who knows about social reputation systems more than than we do in this room, right? And so I think you're going to, just based on the conversations I've been having um, from folks who are based in the United States, but honestly, especially abroad, you're seeing a lot of people talk about um, reputation management using blockchain. Now that can, um, that can be done at the user level. Sometimes you're looking at verification systems uh, that look at device level. So I've met companies who are working using blockchain chain to, um, to try to cut down on the impact of, of bots and bot farms in, in games. And so they're really looking at, um, at tracking uh, player input at the device level. And, but you can imagine, you know, as we continue to figure this out in the world of games, what implications it has for the world at large. Um, anyway, I just think that's pretty interesting. And then, of course, um, we all know production costs are out, out of control and, and also a lot of free to play games have limited revenue streams, right, because of the whole app store if you're a mobile app store ecosystem. And so um, we all know about how games and blockchain can also strip away the central of authority and all that. So we've talked about that already. And so I'm seeing a large number of companies that are springing up in, in the space that are doing this in various ways. So D Market is, is one that I think is actually pretty interesting uh, company. They uh, are working on what I would essentially call an eBay for virtual goods and sort of it's touching on the whole model we discussed earlier about how um, you know you can extend the value of virtual goods by allowing another revenue stream, another market for selling and trading those. And that not only has the potential to benefit developers, it also has the potential to benefit players and to extend their engagement with our games, right? If they can actually do something with a virtual goods asset that they own. And uh, I think we touched on this earlier, how a lot of the traditional games, game developers and traditional publishers are very litigious around whether you bring their superhero character into another game. I mean, eventually that's going to have to break away because the, the trend is really heading towards reusing and repurposing um, virtual goods um, in, in other games and across games. Uh, and so uh, D Market is one company I thought is approaching that in an interesting way. And here's another example of another platform maker that is trying to establish a secondary revenue stream. And I mean, I just I just picked chose a few examples. There are, as you well know, many of these titles springing up, right? Which should be a a sign of um, a trend, but it should also maybe be a, a word of caution to us as we go down the road and choose potential partners. They're, they're all different, right? That's something I've noticed just looking at these different uh, offerings, platform offerings is um, they all offer something a little bit different and I can speak more to that in, in a little bit. Um, and, you know, I think potentially one of the things that I really feel resonant with in terms of the, the opportunity we have leveraging um, blockchain technology is just the creative opportunities, right? I mean, things that uh, we may not even know we can do or, or think are possible in terms of design and implementation and in terms of player um, communities. So for example, I was at, attending Games Beat a few weeks ago and I was at a round table uh, with a bunch of uh, uh, blockchain based companies and there was a pretty interesting discussion how, how um, 
if, if, if player reputations are, are managed more in ter, in, um, and follow a player maybe f throughout a game or throughout multiple games, that opens up potential around how you structure player guilds, for example, and how um, large you can allow communities um, to grow and work together. Um, because we've seen a lot in games where guild size structures tend to work, can work very well within games and the larger that grows, sometimes those, those um, gameplay patterns kind of fall apart or emerging behavior comes up that you wouldn't expect that maybe breaks what, what you think you were thinking how your game would work. So the, I would, you know, there's a lot about how blockchain, um, you know, people talk about its limitations and we all know sitting in this room Room that game development is as much about limitations as it is about innovation and opportunity. So I would definitely encourage all of us because at this point um, there's there's a lot there are a lot there's a lot of noise right now in the space and I really feel the opportunity to stand out is, is there. But but there has to be something that's differentiating, right? Some kind of differentiating uh, feature or or experience. And I would say. You know, what, what does blockchain, um, what kinds of constructs exist there that might give us an opportunity to play around with how, how um, group structure work or group play or cooperative gameplay, for example, work? That's just my um, PSA. Uh, obviously, uh, my, one of my favorite reasons uh, that I've really been drawn to this arena is that it has the potential to allow you to bypass traditional investment, right? I've, I've raised venture capital before and I will probably never do it again. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it took me months. And the minute I raise my A round, I mean, the next month I am hitting Sand Hill Road up to try to raise my B round. And it was just, a I mean, it, I had wonderful investors, but it was just, I was on the hamster wheel and I really didn't feel like um, I could focus Focus as much on the product and the game, and and I, you know, and that was sort of my job as the CEO. So, uh, it's very appealing to bypass traditional. Um, ways of financing game if games if you're not bootstrapping it yourself. So look at BitGuild. I think BitGuild is one of the ones that does a really good job. Um, in general, their approach is, is pretty good in my opinion. Um, but they raised $20 million in six hours as opposed to me raising a million dollars in three months. <laughs> and it was already spent. By the time we got it, got it into the account, it was already spent. Now. Now, I know things are changing right now in terms of the ICO landscape and what have you, uh, and so that might be diff that approach might be different right now. But I just think um, it's really funny to see the, this kind of news, like the the uh, big guilds of the world, and then to hear investors like Bill Gurley uh, of Benchmark Capital, for example, just decry. Uh, he's you know he's sick of talking about blockchain, and then a few days later you hear. Or benchmark makes their own investments in blockchain. So, so I like the tension that this is that this is creating as an investment landscape. Um, it's not going to be accessible to everybody, but um, you know, I really think the companies that are. Um, that are do, approaching this in a smart way. In some ways, they have an international presence and they might already have an existing audience to tap into. And so BitGuild is one of the ones I think is pretty interesting. You know, I've spoke with a bunch of companies and I want to also invite everybody here, uh, you know, either uh, add me on LinkedIn, um, you know, go to M2 Insights. Uh, you know, I want to speak with more companies. It's, it's my job, but I'm also interested. But, um, and just to hear what, what everyone's doing anyway. But one thing, um, we all know when you're talking about a very frothy market scenario, right? Marketplace scenario. It's, we're in the frothy phase of blockchain, right? Is, is, is the service that I'm being asked to maybe work with or consider, or is my idea, is it, is it truly value add, right? Because um, 
sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the potential of you know getting all that money and raising all that money but once you have a platform is it really going to be something that content creators are going to want to adopt is it really going to add value is it going to be easy to use is it going to be around in five years is it going to be shut down by the SEC um, is it going to be really buggy so that my game breaks so all these questions um, are so important right now, especially if you're a smaller um, company. And um, we all have heard about the challenges of um, using blockchain technologies that it's slow, right? It's slow. It takes a long, you know, potentially a long time to reconcile um, and, and draw consensus. And one thing I would suggest, and I'm sure you've probably already done this, is um, just to, just to, um, and this is kind of what my job is to do, so if you do it, send it to me, is just to look at the different white papers and the different solutions out there and just see how people are addressing the slowness issue with their offering. And it's really interesting to see how consensus is reached through these various platforms or, pra or best practices. And then, um, and then again, to me, when people would, uh, you know, because I was actually, I was actually going to raise some money to do a, um, a blockchain-based initiative myself, and one of the things I heard all the time, it's slow, it's slow. And I was like, you know what? That is an opportunity. That, that is a design opportunity. You know, what about the slowness factor um, is interesting or, or can, be, can be, I mean, it's generally terrible, right? So how can you solve it? And then what, where, where you can't solve it, what are, what are, what's the design thinking you're using to work around that or to not have that be as painful an experience to your end user? So I would say, yes, it's slow. People are getting creative with the solutions. Look at the different um, white papers out there. There's so much information in a lot of them. Some of them are written really well, some of them not. And then, and then try to figure out for what you can solve, like what are the design challenges there and how can you basically you know, ma fake it till you make it or mask that. And then, um, of course, we heard about the scalable issue where CryptoKitties broke Ethereum. And that really scared a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people I talk to to this day are still worried about this scenario and what that might imply. And then, of course, uh, I cannot emphasize enough uh, the legal, the, the, you know, the legal, the tax, the international law implications. Everybody in this room who is doing anything this is easy for me to say, right? Everyone in this room who's doing anything that is related to blockchain or cryptocurrency really needs an, a legal opinion. Um, it, even if you're working with a platform, so I, I represent a company called Robot Sea Monster Games, and they're doing a lot, they worked with uh, Brooklyn Microgrid Energy, so smart energy. So again, another example of folks in games who are going to other sectors doing what we do in games, but doing it for them. And, you know, it's, it, everyone who is even touching this stuff has to have um, a, a legal opinion and try to have themselves covered. And some of the work we do is skating more on the edge than others. Um, especially if you're getting into international um, implementation. I forgot to mention before one thing I thought was interesting with CryptoKitties is, you know, they went the traditional route of, of how they um, created their tokens and, and they sold their, their asset on the um, marketplace. They've now gone to China, so they've expanded internationally, but they've also raised venture capital. So you're seeing... Um, that is a trend, but everybody here, I know it's easier said than done, attorneys are expensive, but, but find an attorney if you can. Find one who not only has an, a background in IP law, but who really understands the whole blockchain uh, ecosystem. I know they can be expensive. Sometimes they'll give you free advice. Um, and then uh, another thing I'm seeing, which is, which is just to be very frank, is, uh, you know, I, I have been trying to map and compare people's roadmaps, and they're just wildly different. And so if you do all that work, send it to me. And, um, <laughs> but it's, it's just, I mean, the landscape is vast. And I have to admit, a lot of folks who, who got into this early, they ha they're sitting on a wad of cash, that cash 
that cash goes up and down depending on the whims of the marketplace and how much they've they've um, extracted from that. But I do, you know, if you do work with partner with a platform, you know, um, really make sure that you interrogate their expertise and their operational expertise because a lot of times um, you get the sense that it's like, oh my God, we we have so much money now what? And um, and if you know you're working on that or you're or you're developing that, just just um, make sure that you de-risk, you take away as much risk as you, as you possibly can. So if you're working with a platform, you know, what happens if they go away? What, what legal protections do they have? You know, who, who's advising them? Do you have access to their source code? I mean, is that something, if you're using a platform, um, I always advise. I know that's a tricky one sometimes, but hey, I push for it if I'm a small business owner. Um, and I think, you know, it's not to be ignored that major companies are getting into the game. I just pulled two recent examples. You know, Facebook is, uh, ha is building its own blockchain um, scenario, um, tech scenario. They want to have their own coin. Comcast Ventures, I mean, I just picked two, but I mean, there are tons of this in the news. And so with that in mind, this, the special announcement I wanted to make is that uh, I'm going to be co-authoring and, 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 and spearheading a market watch survey that I'm going to be um, creating to try to map and get a handle on what's going on in the blockchain sector, specifically with games. but. Um, but throughout various uh, industry sectors, I just feel like it's rapidly changing. We all know it's changing. And so I will keep everyone who's interested involved um, and, and informed when it launches, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, but reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to. But uh, hopefully we'll get, um, we'll get a really good handle of the different um, technologies, the platforms, how they differ from each other. Um, you know, what kind, uh, where they're deployed, all that kind of stuff. It's just a vast landscape. So I really wish you all the best <laughs> and wish you all much continued success. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for Margaret? Is that a tentative hand? Uh, just wait for, the, wait for the microphone to come to you. And if you, if you can tell us who you are and uh, where you're from. Where are we uh, the gentleman behind you there. Hi, I'm Alex Atal. I'm one of the co-founders of OpenSea from mm -hmm. we're now cool. based in New York. Uh, I was wondering, there are a lot of like new protocols for gaming-specific tokens that are coming out, but don't have plans to build a killer app, like a CryptoKitty-style game yeah. on top of them. Uh, do you know any that actually are building a killer app alongside the, the platform, or what do you think of like building the platform in isolation? So that's a classic, classic uh, issue with anyone who builds platforms in games. You know, you can build the best platform, but if you don't have showcase content on it, um, I see people trying to do both. Uh, if I were a platform maker and I was trying to raise money for this, my approach would have been to try to get one of the big publishers as an anchor and, and, the, and the, within the right genre. Um, Ideally, you would want to raise enough money where you could deploy a, a, a showcase title on top of the platform, because there's nothing worse than spending millions of dollars building your platform. You can't find anyone to deploy your content on it. And, in, and if you don't find the right mass of developers, like the right kinds of developers, so if you're, uh, you know, and it's the wrong audience, it could be death for a platform. You could have the best platform in the world. If you don't have content that exposes those features, it's worthless. So. You know, if, if you're taking the risk to work on a platform, maybe there's some kind of re financial relationship or something that could really help uh, mitigate risk for all concerned. It, it's, a, it's a huge issue, like uh, I see all the time. Very good, very good question. Yeah, I think that's the one we're all looking to see when these platforms launch. It's just going to be tumbleweed. There's <laughs> one, other, one other hand. <laughs> tumbleweed. Had a question. Any other question? Oh, this. This will be the last one for Margaret. I like that tumbleweed <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> it's very west. Hey, Mark. Speak loudly, yeah. Hey, Margaret. Um, I'm Prof um, from Miami. And uh, my question is, since you have like both the, um, the, vent the venture capital and I assume a little bit of Wall Street experience, and now the crypto, you know, with all the SEC cracking down, like what's the, what's the, uh, end game per se like you know if it costs 
as much or more to do an ICO than do an IPO? Like, what's the point? You know, is that what the SEC is trying to do? Make everyone actually do do an IPO and just you know crush the market? Or what's going to happen to all all of our our gaming tokens? That's a great question, and I, I, w I probably should defer to an attorney uh, around that. Uh, my sense is this trajectory is inevitable, and I think there are going to be some there's there are going to be some really intense pain points. There are going to be some, some examples held up from the SEC to, you know, who are just skating on the edge. But the, I think the, the barn door, to use another Western <laughs> metaphor, the barn door is open and I think it's inevitable and I think you see it with, with uh, the, these companies, these larger companies entering the landscape. So there will be some examples made. Um, that's why it's really important um, to try to be as conservative as possible. So if I were raising money right now, I would probably go for traditional investment and then I would consider an ICO down the line.